Welcome to Bordeaux and this introduction to Bordeaux. Um, I have been in Bordeaux for about 25 years, and if you can tell from my accent, I'm not French. I was born in Texas. Um, and I like to say that living in Bordeaux is a little bit like being a golfing widow. You either learn about golf or you suffer in silence, and, and Bordeaux wines are the same. So a number of years back, I, uh, I did a class in enology, which is the science of wine, and I learned. So uh, the thing I want to say to you is there are no students questions, please do ask questions. The way you do that is there's a chat function. It should be at the bottom of your screen. You can put your questions in there and Dustin will moderate at the end of the, uh, the sequence. So um, uh, we'll hopefully get to a few questions after I talk to you a little bit about uh, Bordeaux. Now normally when I do this class in Bordeaux in situ, we have a wine tasting at the end, so please feel free to drink wine with me at the end. I'm certainly going to, <laughs> but uh, if it's too early for you, in fact, 11 o'clock in the morning is probably one of the best times to taste wine. So uh, without further ado, let me share my screen with you and we'll get on to uh, the Bordeaux tasting. We're gonna have a historical overview of Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux today, Bordeaux diversity, um, and uh, like I said, normally there's a tasting, but uh, you can do that on your own if you like. So um, let's start with the historical overview. So there's very little historical evidence up until about the 10th to the 12th centuries of winemaking in Bordeaux. However, we do know who planted the vines and that was the Romans. So somewhere around 48 or 56 BC, uh, Verdigala, as it was called in those days, was part of Roman, the Roman Empire. Uh, it's important in the uh, commerce of tin and lead towards Rome. In fact, they were bringing in wines long before they planted vines for uh, their soldiers. They, it gave them something to drink, as you may know that the water was unfit to drink at that time. So they also brought in a grape variety called Bisserica, uh, which was a species which was well adapted to our relatively cool climate. Evidence of how they planted vines can be seen in Saint-Emilion even today. They dug out these troughs, as you can see on the screen, the shallow, very, very shallow troughs. They filled them with dirt and they planted the, uh, the vines in them. So again, there was very little evidence up until about the 10th centuries when the church started uh, con the construction of many, many monasteries over from the 10th to the 13th centuries. Uh, this allowed for, for the expansion of the vineyard in Bordeaux. So Bordeaux wines was domestically popular, French wine was seldom exported, and the area covered by the vineyards and the volume produced were very, very low. Is this the so Bordeaux, Bordeaux, like any other business, has always suffered a series of booms and busts. Uh, and one of the first booms came in the 12th century with the entrance of a lovely lady you can see on your screen called Eleanor of Aquitaine. And during this time, um, she, when she married the, uh, um, the Count Henry Plantagenet, who was born in France, in Le Mans, he just so happened to be the son of the king, he, uh, they got married in 1152, middle of the 12th century. A couple of months after they got married, his father died, which made him King of England. His father just so happened to be the King of England. So he became King of England, she became Queen of England. When they got married, she had given to him as a dowry, the, um, the, the Duchy of Aquitaine. Now Aquitaine was one of the largest um, duchies in France at that time. So uh, when they got, when he became king and she became queen of England, Aquitaine logically became English territory. And it stayed English territory for almost 300 years. So the Anglo-Gascon government was set up uh, in the port which you can visit in Bordeaux today. Um, this is one of the old medieval walls of the city. It was ruled from England, however. The French, needless to say, were not very happy that their country was being ruled by the English, and the French and the English were rivals from the 11th to the 15th century. Sometimes I think they're still rivals. But the Gascons did not like the French crown for many, many reasons, uh, but particularly because they tended to drink Burgundy and Champagne, not Bordeaux. It was much easier to get wines 
from Burgundy and Champagne into Paris for the French crown to drink than it was to get them all the way from the southern part of, of France, Bordeaux. So during this time, obviously, our wines were exported into England, and this accounts for the abundance of claret in England. Sales of Bordeaux wines represented the largest volume of commercial traffic in medieval the port of Bordeaux was absolutely buzzing. So as the popularity of Bordeaux wines increased, uh, the vineyards expanded to accommodate the demands from abroad. And at that time, the English were still Catholic and consumed a lot of wine. So Bordeaux effectively became England's cellar. The export of Bordeaux was halted during uh, the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War in 1337. So by the end of the conflict in 1453, and if you count, it's not exactly 100 years, but who's counting? So in 1453, the uh, end of the Hundred Years' War took place very near saint emilion and France repossessed the province, thus taking control of the wine production in the region. This is when the triangular trade started. In 1462, Bordeaux attained uh, a parliament, but it... Uh, only regained of importance in the 16th century when it became the center of distribution of sugar. Uh, so the Bordeaux privilege was a tax on the wines coming from upriver, further upriver, because uh, as we'll see in a moment on the map, there's a major river coming through the port of Bordeaux and any wines coming from further up, the English at the time had set a tax on them. So it was called the Bordeaux privilege. So the Bordelais made a lot of money. Uh, in the 14th century, under English rule, only about 14% of wines benefited from this privilege. Over half of all wines sold benefited from this privilege. Um, in the middle of the 15th century. Hang on. Okay, can, you, you can hear me okay? So it said I was muted, sorry about that. Um, uh, when the uh, French crown took this area back in the 15th century, they kept that tax break in place and we all love a tax break. So this is what made the Gascons loyal to the French crown. So it was only halted in uh, 1776. So with the loss of the English demand for our wines, the first thing we went, do is, went, went to do was uh, to search for a new market for our wines. And this is the first time the Dutch step in. Now we love the Dutch in Bordeaux. They were great consumers of the white wines uh, made in Germany at that stage. And at that time, Bordeaux made predominantly white wines. Uh, they liked the sweet white wines, but they also distilled them. They had ships, they had colonies, so they shipped them out to the colonies. And what wasn't shipped to the colonies was distilled uh, into gin. So we're talking about the Dutch traders. The Dutch stepped in uh, in the uh, 15th century. And uh, the, in the late 16th century, we started up trade with the West Indies and we opened up and exchanged eau de vie and wine for sugar and spices. Um, so let's move forward into the 17th century now. Uh, the 17th century, some very interesting things happened in an area called the Medoc, which you should see on your screen now in the little map. The Medoc is very, very flat and very marshy. And it's a peninsula surrounded by water. In fact, the word Medoc comes from Old French in media aqua, between the waters, uh, the Garonne and the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, the King Henry IV of France in the early 17th century, again, asked the Dutch engineers, they knew all about being under the level of the sea. He asked them to drain the Medoc because uh, they, they were very good at draining the Medoc. And uh, they did this purely so that they could cross the land and go up to the tip and have a easier access to the port of La Rochelle, which was a bit further up to the north. Some of these drainage ditches can still be seen today. Um, uh, they were not, there were not many vines planted in the Medoc in the late 17th century. Any vines were only planted on the higher ground. So once they drained the, the area, they realized that it was quite good um, And so the well-to-do, the merchants, the aristocracy of Bordeaux, they everywhere. So in 1725, the spread of vineyards throughout Bordeaux was so vast that it was divided into very specific areas so that the consumer could tell exactly where each wine was from. 
This collection of, of dishes became known as the Vignoble de Bordeaux, or the Bordeaux Vineyard. And each bottle was labeled with both the region and the area where they originated from. So sales of Bordeaux wines flourished again, and we had another boom period. Um, I want to talk now about a little guy called Arnaud de Pontac, who just so happened to be And in the late 17th century, he started experimenting with winemaking techniques. Up until then, the wines coming out of Bordeaux were uh, what we call clairé, or clear wines. Clair means clear. So they were light reds between a rosé and a red. Um, this is where the term claret comes from, because as General de Gaulle says, English is just badly pronounced French. The English did not know how to uh, pronounce claret, so it's anything come a border red wine is called a claret. So he started using sulfur in his barrels to disinfect them, to keep wines from turning to vinegar, and uh, he noticed that his wines became more and more powerful. So the structure of our wines started to get deeper and darker red. He also was one of the first direct marketing people. Um, he sent his son to London to create what we call um, uh, the Pontax Head, which was a pub where they sold only their wine. And this new French claret became ever popular. So just to recap, 17th century, new land becomes available. There's a wealthy merchant class with deep pockets new style of wine becoming increasingly popular. So the merchants bought huge plots of land and started planting vineyards in large chateaus. So the 18th century, which you can see a lovely picture of the riverside of Bordeaux on your right, uh, was the golden age of Bordeaux. Many downtown buildings, about 5,000, including those on the riverside, are from this period. Victor Hugo found the town so beautiful, he once said, take Versailles, add Antwerp, and you have Bordeaux. And the Baron Haussmann, who was a longtime prefect of Bordeaux, used Bordeaux's 18th century big scale real rebuilding model when he was asked by the Emperor Napoleon III to transform the then quasi medieval Paris into a modern capital that would make France proud. So let's talk about classifications now. The Medoc region is the one that most people know of when they think of Bordeaux wines. And why? Because of this classification that was done in 1855. It's not the only classification we have, but it is the most well-known one. Um, it's in 1855, Napoleon asked the wine merchants of Bordeaux at the event of the Universal Exhibition, when they brought their wines up to Paris to show them to the consumers, <clears throat> he bought, asked them to create a ranking order uh, and to so that the consumer could tell the difference of what's a good wine, what's a great wine, and which wines are, were, were ex, uh, very, very high quality. So they did that in just a couple of months using sales ledgers, using uh, price and sales quantities. Uh, they drew up a list, one, two, three, four, five. So you have first classified growth, which are the top, second, third, fourth, and fifth easy. So these wines were classified, 61 reds and 26 whites. 60 of the reds came from the Medoc. The one other red that did was not in the Medoc region was, you guessed it, Chateau Aubryon, Pessac Leonion, um, because of uh, Arnaud de Pontac's work that he'd done. Uh, the rest of the wines were the Sautern Sweet from the southeastern part of Bordeaux. So the Medoc very, very quickly established itself as the go-to for uh, red wines from Bordeaux. And they've kept this reputation today. So just so you know, the first five classified gross, the creme de la creme, are Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, La Tour, uh, Margot, and of course, Aubryon got its position as a first classified. Um, there are a number of seconds, thirds, fourths, and fifths. By the time you get past the second tier, you forget uh, which is which. So there's a little brochure which has them listed on the back, which is quite good. So this classification is relatively unchanging. Um, Chateau Mouton Rothschild had it revised in 1973. Only one other time has it ever been changed. And not a lot of people know about the first time it was changed. It was three months after its inception. A feisty lady who owned Chateau Contemel in the Medoc was not included in this list, and she was able to be 
uh, included after lobbying to be put in. Lots and lots of, uh, of the wine merchants of Bordeaux who owned these wineries, uh, they also lobbied at the very beginning <clears throat> and they were never allowed in. So there are other classifications that came about. 1932, you have the Cru Bourgeois. Uh, 1955, you have saint emilion uh, they reclassified their wines, 1959, the Grave, Pesec-Léonion, and 1989, and the Cru Artisan of the Médoc in 2006. So here we are up to the 19th century, and it's all about disease and innovation. Um, classification was a great thing for Bordeaux wines, and it made them very popular, uh, so much so that they planted vines everywhere. And uh, whenever you get a monoculture, what do you get? Disease. So from 1875 to 1892, almost all of France's vineyards, and particularly Bordeaux, were ruined, wiped out by the phylloxera infestation. Now, phylloxera is a, an aphid. It's a little bug that gets into the roots of the plants, and it kills the plant before you even know you've got it. <clears throat> it was brought over on American rootstock. The region's wine industry was rescued by grafting, and you can see a little uh, graft. You can see the red stuff is wax around the rootstock. Now, the American rootstock is uh, resistant to this aphid. There is no cure for it. The only solution is to graft on our grape varieties onto American rootstock. Um, so the rootstock doesn't affect the production nor the taste of the grapes. And, and we did try to plant American grape varieties, but they tasted foxy in our soils. So owing to the lucrative nature of this business, other areas in France began growing uh, their own vines and labeling them as Bordeaux products. And as profits of the Aquitaine region declined, the vignerons demanded that the government impose laws declaring that only produce from Bordeaux could be labeled as Bordeaux and hence was born the INAO. This stands for the uh, National Institute of Appellations of Origin. This was created in 1935. And in 1936, the, they responded, the government responded to appeals from the winemakers and merchants that all regions in France had the, the name of their wines uh, by the place where they were grown. Uh, they were labeled with the AOC approved stamps and the products were officially confirmed to be from that region. Uh, this law later extended to other goods. Think of Roquefort cheese. It's made in Roquefort. Uh, poultry, vegetables. Uh, we have strawberries called Gariguet. It um, went over to a lot of other things. So we'll talk about Bordeaux today. Bordeaux is not the largest vineyard in France, but the largest quality vineyard. We sell roughly 6 million liters of wine every year for about a, a value of over 4.5 billion euros. That's about 50 million cases produced every year with about half of it, just over half, sold on the French market. So in relation to other AOCs, so other appellations, Bordeaux is not the largest vineyard, but it's the largest quality vineyard. By that we mean AOC. The appellations are all about Quality, Appellation d'origine contrôlée. You'll see it in, on every single bottle. Controlled origin of appellation. We have about 275,000 acres under vine in Bordeaux, and that makes up about 1.5% of the world's planted vineyards. You can see from the slide that Champagne has a mere 83,500 acres. Um, Languedoc-Roussillon, which is often combined, is a very large region but it only has, under AOC, about 608,000 acres. So we sell, as I said, 4.7 million hectoliters every year. Um, in the past 20 years, the number of growers has fallen from about 15,000 winery, estates, properties, um, domains in 1993 to 5,834 to be exact in 2018. It's not because we're ripping up vines. It's because the larger producers are um, buying up most of the smaller producers and they're incorporating them into their portfolios. So therefore the average estate size has just about doubled from about 17 acres in 1993 up to about 47 acres in 2018. So we have 29 wine co-ops and about 30 wine merchant firms sell 
70% of our produce. So we've been drinking wine uh, since almost the beginning of the time today. Uh, wine is produced in over 50 countries and in almost every single state in the US. I'm not saying it's all good, but France is the world's largest wine producer. We're pretty neck and neck with Italy. Italy seems to, to we go back and forth uh, between who's the largest. But of all of the French wine regions, and you can see, I don't know if you see my pointer down here, is in the southwest corner, we have Bordeaux. So we are about two hours north uh, in a car, driving to the southern uh, Spanish border, and about two hours from Paris on the fast train up in the north. So Bordeaux is probably the most well-known and the most popular. Champagne up here, of course, is a, a staple around holiday times and for special occasions. Burgundy here. Um, is very well known and then you have the Loire Valley here. So uh, southwest corner down near Spain is Bordeaux. So we're on the 45th parallel. Uh, some U.S. towns that are uh, on the, about the same level, Bangor, Maine, Minneapolis, Salem, Oregon, Oregon we're quite high up. Um, so this is our Appalachians map and this is one of my favorite tools I like to use when teaching about about wine. So the size of our vineyard, 275,000 acres, um, and the diversity of the soils, the climates, the microclimates, the blends, the varietals, all explain the diversity of the wines produced around Bordeaux. Um, altogether, we have 65 of these appellations. We'll talk, talk a little bit about what an appellation is. Some of them only produce very small quantities, but we make up about a quarter of all of French AOC wines, so quality wines. So what exactly is an Appalachian? No, it's not a mountain range. Um, basically the concept of the Appalachians is all about quality. The 20th century is all about rules and regulations. Um, this new legislation and quality protection from 1936 led them to create these 65 Appalachians who govern everything, govern everything from the planting of our grapes all the way up to the bottling. So um, we uh, set rules and regulations as to how closely together we can plant the vines, um, which grape varieties we can use are governed by the Appalachians, what we put on our labels uh, and what chemical treatments we can use, how much sulfur they govern our yields, absolutely everything. Now, Appalachian, the word Appalachian, je m'appelle Mary. My name is Mary. Appalachian is just a place name. So um, what they've done is they've drawn uh, circles around or they've, they've delimited geographical regions. So you see Poyac, St. Julian over here in the Medoc. Um, on the other side, you've got saint Emilion, Pomerol, Fronsac, um, all of these names are appellations, um, and it's like gerrymandering political districts. Uh, we've drawn geographical areas where those wines are produced. So any wines produced in Margot can be called Margot. Any wine produced outside of that area cannot be called Margot. Um, so again, 65 appellations. You can see the dots here means uh, what color of wines we produce. You see all these ones here on the northernmost side uh, produce red, the green dot is dry white, and the golden dot is, um, those are the sweet whites, and then we have rosés and cremos, we'll get into that in just a moment. So um, you may have heard of a, a region called the right bank or left bank, this is because we have two rivers in Bordeaux, this, the, the northernmost river is the Dordogne River and it has its source way off here to the east in the Massif Central. And the southernmost river is the Garonne River and it starts in the Pyrenees and they flow out towards the ocean. They form the Gironde Estuary just about at Margot. Um, and so anything to the right of these rivers is considered right bank and anything to the left is considered left bank. That's quite important because they're referred to quite often. So Medoc and Grave region, Grave quite simply means gravel, down here this orange region, those are the left bank wines and really anything uh, to the right of, or the northern and eastern side of those are right bank wines. So saint Emilion, Pomerol, Fronsac, all of these. This green area in the center is called the Entre-deux-Mer. Entre-deux-Mer means quite simply 
between two C's. So that's um, that area as well, which also considered right bank. So uh, we make so many different types of wines in Bordeaux that we like to divide them up into different families to make them easier to understand. The size of the vineyard and the diversity of the soil, the microclimates, the blends, the varietals, um, explain all the diversity of wines we have here in Bordeaux. We have reds, Clairé. Clairé are, our clairés are very seldom uh, exported. Again, that's our dark rosé. Very seldom exported, but it's a nice uh, light red to have on a hot summer's day if you don't want to have a red wine. Then we do more and more rosé these days. Dry white, sweet whites, and Cremant. Cremant is our sparkling wine, and that is made in the traditional method. Only champagne is made in Champagne appellation. So anywhere else, the same type of wine is called Cremant. So we've got Cremant in most areas of, of, of France. <clears throat> so we like to split them up into seven different families. We've got Bordeaux and Bordeaux Supérieur, which is 40% of our, our surface area planted. Um, these are uh, red wines. They're, they're very good value for money and um, kind of entry level wines. The next area we have are the coat wines up here, 13% of our surface area planted. Coat means slopes. And these are the limestone slopes on the right bank. Um, this is where you get quite a lot of very, very good value for money, quite a lot of restaurant wines. You find quite a lot of coat wines in the US. I highly recommend trying some of them because they are um, very, very affordable. And then we have the uh, uh, Medoc Grave and Pessac Léonion. So we've got the Medoc, which is 14% of our wines, and then Grave and Sauté of our wines. <clears throat> and then we've got Saint-Emilion and Pomerol. Uh, Saint-Emilion, Pomerol, Fronsac of 11% of our wines. Then we have dry wines and sweet wines. So we have a whole plethora of wines. As for styles of wines, we've also got a lot of styles of wines. We've got the fresh dry white wines of the Entre de Mer and the Grave with a higher acidity. We've got rosé or clary, light and fresh wines. Creamy whites, so oaky graves, it's coming from the Pessac Léonion region and some Entre de Mer's. Some earthy Bordeaux, Bordeaux Supérieur, Côtes wines. Uh, mellow and fruity wines from the right banks and the Côtes. Some intense left bank wines, hedonistic fruit bombs, new style right bank reds, light sweet from Saint-Croix-du-Mont and Cadillac, Cadillac, uh, which is one of our wine growing areas, Lupiac, uh, luscious sweet Sauterne wines uh, of, the, of the sweet wines. So lots and lots of different types of wines and styles of wines. So Bordeaux is very special and what makes it so special is that we're based on this concept of terroir for which there is no English translation. But terroir quite honestly just starts with the soil, which you can see right in the middle, the type of soil. We plant certain grape varieties on different types of soil um, where they will thrive. So then after the soil, we have the disposition of the land. Are you flat? Are you along the riverside? Are you on those coats and on the slopes? Um, the climate, the microclimate, so are you by the ocean with the coastal winds or are you further inland on cooler soils and cooler climates? Uh, all of those make up the terroir, but it also has to do with the human factor. How do we prune our vines? Do we plant cover crops to create competition for the, uh, for the, the vine roots? Um, all of these things come, all of these factors make up the concept of terroir. And because of its unique position, Bordeaux has a very unique terroir. So uh, because we're on the 45th parallel, we have a very temperate climate. We have lovely hot summers, fine autumns. Sometimes our summers uh, fall into uh, a, a long Indian summer and they last well into October, November. Um, sometimes, but sometimes in the winter it snows, but the snow very rarely sticks. It's wet and humid not like Florida, more like Seattle. Uh, we are on the Gulf Stream, so that warms us up a bit. We have a pine forest, which Napoleon built, or he planted just to the south of us. He planted that to um, uh, prevent the erosion of the beaches. Uh, and that protects us from coastal storms. So it's quite an unusual 
position. So let's talk about the soils now very quickly. We have a variety of soils, so we have a variety of grape, grape varieties planted there. The left bank is predominantly gravel. You can see uh, sometimes it's up to 12 meters deep, and our gravel has, has um, come in through our two rivers, the uh, Dordogne and the, and the Garonne rivers, uh, and they have traveled very, very far, so it's very small stone. Uh, it's not the big galley like you get in the Rhone, so it's very, very small. Uh, we don't want our wines to have too much water, and it's also very good because of the, um, uh, it, it heats up. It, it keeps the heat during the day, and it um, reflects it back over the cool evenings, allowing for a very, very even maturation. Um, gravel is also uh, 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 in a lot of the areas along these two rivers. So it's been deposited on, the, on either side of these river banks. So next we have clay. And in the Entre de Mer, that, that in between the two seas, uh, in between the two rivers, we have lots and lots of clay. We have clay pretty much everywhere in Bordeaux, but predominantly in the Entre de Mer. Clay is cool and it's wet. The third type of soil we have is limestone. Limestone acts like a big sponge. It soaks up the water. And because by our Appalachian regulations, we are not allowed to irrigate our vines, um, it, the uh, limestone acts as a natural irrigation. It soaks up the water. And in our hot, sun, sunny summers, it spits it back via capillarity. Um, so sometimes you can see from this picture that there's only a clay on top of the limestone, so the roots have to dig deep to find their source of water and nutrients. This is why you sometimes hear people talking about minerality. So lastly, we have very different grape varieties which were allowed to plant. We can plant Pinot Noir in, in our area, but we can't call it Bordeaux um, or Shiraz uh, or anything else. We are allowed to plant predominantly Merlot, which takes up most of our planting um, and it's growing. Merlot is a very easy grape variety for the consumer to understand. Um, it's full of red, ripe, strawberry, raspberry aromas. Um, and it's got more sugar, therefore it's got more alcohol. Alcohol exacerbates flavor. Um, it's one of the first one that ripens, so it's the first one that we pick. Um, and this allows it to be a little bit safer because it often starts raining in the middle of our harvest. So if you come at the beginning, you're often, you often profit from this Indian summer. So in Bordeaux, I don't know if you know this, but we blend our wines um, in Bordeaux, it's all about the blend, all about the location, all about the area, and less about the single varietal. We do have a few single varietals, um, but not many. So uh, in our blends, we have Merlot, we have Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the, the next uh, most planted grape variety in our region. About 22% of our surface area is planted with Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a smaller grape variety with a thicker skin and all of the colors tannins and aromas are found in the skins. So um, therefore Cabernet Sauvignon has much more color, tannin and aromas. And some of those aromas and flavors that are in the Cabernet Sauvignon, they're more black fruits. It's more like the blackberry, black currant, if you know what that, or cassis, if you know what that tastes like. Um, it can also be quite spicy, sometimes green peppery. So it's more complicated. Um, and, and this is why our Cabernet Sauvignons are, are so um, tannic uh, and, and tannins add structure that we must blend them with the Merlot in order for them to be more palatable. So the last uh, major grape variety is Cabernet Franc. In fact, Cabernet Sauvignon is a blend, a, a, a marriage between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc or White Sauvignon. So that's where we get Cabernet Franc, Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon from. And the Merlot and the Cabernet Franc are indigenous to the Bordeaux region. So Cabernet Franc adds structure, it adds elegance, uh, it adds tannins, and a little bit of uh, spiciness. We have a tiny bit of three other great varieties, Carmenere, Malbec, and Petit Verdot, uh, but not, we don't use very much of it. The Malbec, um, you'll know more recently from Argentina, but it originates from just east of here in Cahors, France. 
Um, and it's what the English used to call the black wine. It adds color. Um, in the coat, you can get a very high proportion, sometimes 95 to 99% Malbecs. Um, so I do recommend you searching out one of those and trying those um, because that could be quite interesting. So we blend our wines in Bordeaux. This is why you won't find the name of the varietals or often the percentages in uh, the, the, the wines on our labels. We blend um, it, and the blend can change every year depending on the weather. So for our white wines, we have uh, predominantly, well, 50-50 Semillon Sauvignon Blanc. It used to be we, we produced predominantly Semillon, which is our sweeter grape variety, and you can still find some 100% Semillons here, um, but not very often. More often we, we blend it with Sauvignon Blanc. So the Semillon is sweeter, it's got more sugar, more alcohol. This is what we make our sweet Sautern wines from. Um, it's uh, lighter and it, it's got a, a rich character and very good aging potential. Our Sauvignon Blanc, now don't think uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. New we have done a lot of work on our Sauvignon Blanc to extract the exotic fruit aromas from our, our Sauvignon Blanc. So we have more citrus, so lime, lemon, um, sometimes grapefruit, but also pineapple, um, and, and more exotic fruit aromas. So ours can be a little bit different. And then we have a little bit of muscadel, which is uh, a little bit floral and uh, uh, smooth and, and fruity. So um, with the, the last varietal, Sauvignon Gris, Colombar and Uni Blanc, the last two, Colombar and Uni Blanc, come from up north in Cognac. Cognac is just about an hour and a half drive north of us here in Bordeaux. Um, and so those are, uh, historical grape varieties that we don't really use much of anymore. So that's about all for our introduction to Bordeaux. There you have it, a short history and explanation of our wines here. Thank you, Mary. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mary, for doing this for us. And thank you for all the guests on the, on the talk here who joined today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for hanging out with us here and Mary's drinking wine and making us all jealous. Um, but again, thank you, Mary, and thank you everyone on the call. We, we, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you.